The Battle of Arras was a British offensive during the First World War. From 9 April to 16 May 1917, British, Canadian, South African, New Zealand, Newfoundland, and Australian troops attacked German defences near the French city of Arras on the Western Front. There were major gains on the first day, followed by stalemate. The battle cost nearly 160,000 British casualties and about 125,000 German casualties. For much of the war, the opposing armies on the Western Front were at a stalemate, with a continuous line of trenches stretching from the Belgian coast to the Swiss border. In essence, the Allied objective from early 1915 was to break through the German defences into the open ground beyond and engage the numerically inferior German army in a war of movement. The Arras offensive was conceived as part of a plan to bring about this result. It was planned in conjunction with the French High Command, who were simultaneously embarking on a massive attack about 80 kilometres to the south. The aim of this combined operation was to end the war in 48 hours. At Arras the Allied objectives were to draw German troops away from the ground chosen for the French attack and to take the German-held high ground that dominated the plain of Douai. The British effort was a relatively broad front assault between Vimy in the northwest and Bullecourt in the southeast. After considerable bombardment, Canadian troops advancing in the north were able to capture the strategically significant Vimy Ridge and British divisions in the centre were also able to make significant gains astride the Scarpa River. In the south British and Australian forces were frustrated by the elastic defence and made only minimal gains. Following these initial successes, British forces engaged in a series of small-scale operations to consolidate the newly won positions. When the battle officially ended on 16 May, British Empire troops had made significant advances but had been unable to achieve a breakthrough. New tactics and the equipment to exploit them, with the platoon becoming the principal tactical unit, in four sections. Lewis guns, rifle grenade, bomber and rifle, with the creeping barrage, the Grey's fuse and counter-battery fire had been used particularly in the first phase and had demonstrated that set-piece assaults against heavily fortified positions could be successful. This sector then reverted to the stalemate that typified most of the war on the Western Front. Prelude At the beginning of 1917, the British and French were still searching for a way to achieve a strategic breakthrough on the Western Front. The previous year had been marked by the costly success of the Franco-British offensive astride the River Somme, while the French had been unable to take the initiative because of intense German pressure at Verdun until after August 1916. Both battles consumed enormous quantities of resources while achieving virtually no strategic gains on the battlefield. Nonetheless, the cost to Germany of containing the Anglo-French attacks had been high, and given that the material preponderance of the Entente and its allies could only be expected to increase in 1917, Hindenburg and Ludendorff decided on a defensive strategy on the Western Front for that year. This impasse reinforced the French and British commanders' belief that to end the stalemate they needed a breakthrough, while this desire may have been the main impetus behind the offensive. The timing and location were heavily influenced by a number of political and tactical factors. Political background The mid-war years were momentous times. Governing politicians in Paris and London were under great pressure from the press, the people and the parliaments to bring the war to a victorious close. The casualties from the battles of Gallipoli, the Somme and Verdun had been high and there was little prospect of victory in sight. The British Prime Minister, H. Asketh, resigned in early December 1916 and was succeeded by the Welsh wizard, David Lloyd George. In France, Premier Aristide Briand, with the redoubtable General Hubert Lyotis as Minister of Defence, 
were politically diminished and resigned in March 1917. The United States was close to declaring war on Germany. American public opinion was growing increasingly incensed by a long succession of high-profile U-boat attacks upon civilian shipping, starting with the sinking of RMS Lusitania in 1915 and culminating in the torpedoing of seven American merchantmen in early 1917. The United States Congress finally declared war on Imperial Germany on 6 April 1917, but it would be more than a year before a suitable army could be raised, trained, and transported to France. Strategic background Although the French and British had intended to launch a spring offensive in 1917, the strategy was threatened in February when the Russians admitted that they could not meet the commitment to a joint offensive, which reduced the two-front offensive to a French assault along the Aisne River. In March, the German army in the west withdrew to the Hindenburg Line in Operation Alberic, which negated the tactical assumptions underlying the plans for the French offensive, until French troops advanced to compensate during the battles of Arras. They encountered no German troops in the assault sector and it became uncertain whether the offensive would go forward. The French government desperately needed a victory to avoid civil unrest but the British were wary of proceeding. In view of the rapidly changing tactical situation, in a meeting with David Lloyd George, French Commander-in-Chief General Nivelle persuaded the British Prime Minister that if the British launched a diversionary assault to draw German troops away from the Aisne sector, the French offensive could succeed. It was agreed in the London Convention of 16 January that the French assault on the Aisne would begin in mid-April and that the British would make a diversionary attack in the Arras sector approximately one week prior. Opposing forces three Allied armies were already concentrated in the Arras sector. They were deployed, roughly north to south, as follows. The 1st Army under Horn, the 3rd Army under Allenby, the 5th Army under Gough. The overall British commander was Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig and the battle plan was devised by General Allenby. Unusual for the First World War, three Scottish divisions were near each other for the start of the attack, the 15th Scottish Division of 6th Corps and 9th Scottish Division and 51st Highland Division of 17th Corps. The strongly Scottish-influenced 34th Division was also positioned in the midst of their Scottish 17th Corps neighbours. Facing the British Empire forces were the 6th Army under 73-year-old General von Falkenhausen and the 2nd Army under General von der Marwitz. The armies had been organized as Grappi Suchet, Grappi Vimy and Grappi Aris, deployed in that order north to south. Seven German divisions were in the line, their remaining divisions were in reserve to reinforce or to counter-attack as required. General von Falkenhausen reported directly to General Erich Ludendorff, operational chief of the German High Command. Ludendorff's staff contained several extremely capable officers, notably Major Georg Wetzel, Colonel Max Bauer and Captain Hermann Geyer. Since December 1916, Ludendorff's staff had been developing counter-tactics to oppose the new Allied methods that had been used at the Somme and Verdun. Although these battles were costly for the Allies, they also seriously weakened the German army. In early 1917 the German army was instructed to implement these counter-tactics. Falkenhausen's failure to do so would prove disastrous. Preliminary Phase the British plan was well developed, drawing on the lessons of the Somme and Verdun of the previous year. Rather than attacking on an extended front, the full weight of artillery would be concentrated on a relatively narrow stretch of 11 miles, from Vimy Ridge in the north to Nerville Vitasa, four miles south of the Scarpa River. The bombardment was planned to last about a week at all points on the line with a much longer and heavier barrage at Vimy to weaken its strong defences. During the assault, the troops would advance in open formation, with units leapfrogging each other in order to allow them time to consolidate and regroup. 
Before the action could be undertaken, a great deal of preparation was required, much of it innovative. Mining and tunneling Since October 1916, the Royal Engineers had been tunneling on the Western Front. The Aras region is chalky and easily excavated and under the city there is a vast network of caverns, underground quarries, galleries and sewage tunnels. The Third Army at Arras planned to use the old underground quarries in the city in the offensive plan for April 1917. The underground quarries were to be linked by tunnels so that they could be used as shelters against German artillery fire and to convey troops to the front in secrecy and safety. Assault tunnels were also dug, stopping a few meters short of the German line, ready to be blown open by explosives on zero day. Conventional mines were laid under the German front line, ready to be blown immediately before the assault. German sappers also conducted underground operations, seeking out Allied tunnels to assault and countermine. Of the New Zealand tunnelers, 41 were killed and 151 were wounded by German countermining. The tunneling effort was enormous and in one sector, four tunneling companies of 500 men each worked around the clock in 18-hour shifts for two months. The tunnelers dug 20 kilometers of subways, tramways and railways. Just before the assault, the tunnel system had been enlarged sufficient to conceal 24,000 men, with electric lighting provided by a small powerhouse, kitchens, latrines and a medical center with an operating theater. The bulk of the work was done by the New Zealand Tunneling Company which included Maori and Pacific Islanders from the New Zealand Pioneer Battalion and Bantams from the coalfields of Northern England. Battle in the air Although the Royal Flying Corps entered the battle with inferior aircraft to the Luftstreitkrafter, this did not deter their commander, General Trenchard, from adopting an offensive posture. Dominance of the airspace over Aris was essential for reconnaissance, and the British carried out many aerial patrols. Trenchard's aircraft, acting in support of ground forces, carried out artillery spotting, photography of trench systems and bombing. The reconnaissance activities were coordinated by the first field survey company, Royal Engineers. Aerial observation was hazardous work as, for best results, the aircraft had to fly at slow speeds and low altitude over the German defences. It became even more dangerous with the arrival of the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, with his highly experienced and better equipped flying circus in March 1917. Its deployment led to sharply increased casualty rates among Allied pilots and April 1917 was to become known as Bloody April. One German infantry officer later wrote, During these days, there was a whole series of dogfights which almost invariably ended in defeat for the British since it was Rich Dauphin's squadron they were up against. Often five or six planes in succession would be chased away or shot down in flames. The average flying life of a Royal Flying Corps pilot in Aris in April was 18 hours. Between 4 and 8 April, the Royal Flying Corps lost 75 aircraft in combat, with the loss of 105 aircrew. The casualties created a pilot shortage and replacements were sent to the front straight from flying school. During the same period, 56 aircraft were crashed by inexperienced RFC pilots. Creeping barrage to keep enemy action to a minimum during the assault, a creeping barrage was planned. This requires gunners to lay down a screen of high explosive in shrapnel shells that creeps across the battlefield about 100 meters in advance of the assaulting troops. The Allies had previously used creeping barrages at the battles of Neuve Chapelle and the Somme but had encountered two technical problems. The first was accurately synchronizing the movement of the troops to the fall of the barrage. For Aris, this was overcome by rehearsal and strict scheduling. The second was the barrage falling erratically as the barrels of heavy guns degrade swiftly but at differing rates during fire. For Aris, the rate of degradation of each gun barrel was calculated individually and each gun calibrated accordingly. 
While there was a risk of friendly fire, the creeping barrage forced the Germans to remain in the trenches, allowing Allied soldiers to advance without fear of machine gun fire. Additionally, the new NO. 106 instantaneous fuse had been developed for high explosive shells so that they detonated on the slightest impact, vaporizing barbed wire. Poison gas shells were used for the final minutes of the barrage. Counter-battery fire The principal danger to assaulting troops came from enemy artillery fire as they crossed no man's land, accounting for over half the casualties at the first day of the Somme. A further complication was the location of German artillery, hidden as it was behind the ridges. In response, specialist artillery units were created to attack German artillery. Their targets were provided by First Field Survey Company, Royal Engineers, who collated data obtained from flash spotting and sound ranging. On zero day, the 9th of April, over 80% of German heavy guns in the sector were neutralized by counter-battery fire. Gas shells were also used against the draft horses of the batteries and to disrupt ammunition supply columns.